you're never going to believe this, but I'm in love with an online forum devoted to facial hair. It's called Beardboard, and my brother and I stumbled upon it this past spring when we were attempting to grow our own quarantine beards. And if you know either of us, you know that this is ridiculous, because neither of us could grow a beard in a full year, much less just a couple months. But what hooked me on Beardboard wasn't the beards, but it was rather the community that I had found. It's a place where generosity is encouraged and cruelty is forbidden, where men can throw away the machismo often accompanied with, with positive feedback and just be themselves. As Vox Magazine put it, Beardboard is where toxic masculinity goes to die. But unfortunately, in our everyday lives, we're shockingly different than Beardboard. We're instead what other beard communities are, telling men, look to the Beard Club. They, they tell men that they're where real men beard the most out of their beards. And we don't even know what this means. What we see is that we typically reward the alpha male, that the ideal image of an American man is a six foot four macho stud resembling Rob Gronkowski. He's strong, he's assertive, dominant, almost unfeeling, never showing sadness. But, you know, if you look at me up on this stage or many other men around the world, you see that this doesn't work for everyone. And personally, uh, man to man, bro to bro, with the boys, I just want to cry. Loudly, softly, alone, <laughs> with others. Unadulterated weeping. But the expectations placed on men by toxic masculinity say no, that men like me are pansies, and instead we should grow some chest hair, man up a bit. You see, toxic masculinity isn't meant to demonize men or male attributes, but is rather meant to point out the issues that come from conforming to a traditional male model. But where did this model come from? Where did it originate? Uh, in Reader's Digest magazine, Rebecca Newman examines this and found, finds that pre-industrialization Men who cried were, were leaders. Men who showed emotions and broke the expectations of what we now see as toxic masculinity were seen as people with integrity, people to be looked up to. But industrialization shockingly changed this somehow, as when men stopped working in their homes on their own farms and began working in factories that relied on efficiency and quick tasks to maximize profits, showing emotions was seen as a waste of time. It would disrupt the natural flow of things, and managers saw it as a loss of profit. And this is where we start to see the traditional male model start to originate, as men who work in factories teach their sons that they should not cry because it's a waste of time, and these sons teach their sons that they should not express their emotions because it would disrupt the natural flow of things. Even post-industrialization, toxic masculinity evolved, as when men stopped working in factories and began working in offices with their brains sitting down, journalists warned that they would begin to decay, become weak, or, God forbid, effeminate. The solution was sports. Baseball, basketball, football all begin to arise in this area, in this era rather, and it's not that these sports are uniquely bad, I know I love them myself, but it's rather that they continued the model of the traditional male image the sort of Rob Gronkowski type beat. And this is where we arrive at 2021, as over generations this idea was continued and the expectations placed on men by toxic masculinity are still here. But something that shocks me is how toxic masculinity impacts our everyday lives. And it goes far, much further than anyone would think. Something as simple as wearing a mask or washing one's hands are impacted by this idea of the traditional man. Even pre-COVID-19, researchers at UCLA found that men are 50% less likely to engage in safe virus practices, i.e. wearing a mask, washing hands, staying at home. The reason lies in the traditional male model, as it dictates that men cannot be vulnerable, they cannot show weakness. And the researchers argued that wearing a mask would show that they were submissive to the virus. It would show their weakness, it would show that they were even ostensibly scared, and as a result, men don't do it, or men committed to masculinity don't do these things, which is why we see thousands of men walking around, I don't need to, I don't need to go distance, there's a 97 point whatever survival rate, or the classic, my personal favorite, 
Hey, bro, can you put that up for me? Yeah, my bad, my bad. My bad. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous. Men committed to this act of masculinity would much rather catch the virus, spread it to others, and put themselves at risk than they would put a piece of fabric over their mouth. And if you're thinking anything like me, you've already found the flaw in this argument just using a toxically masculine ideal. You can't wear a mask? What are you, some type of beta male? Let's go, man up. But even beyond COVID, in the, 20, in the year 2020, toxic masculinity impacted our everyday lives. In June of last year, I marched in Salt Lake City to protest the killing of George Floyd, and I found that I was one of few men there. Toxic masculinity dictates that men cannot do things that are seen as effeminate, and, and activism or standing up against social justice is exactly this. Protesting is seen as something for women or something that's gay. And last I checked, I was a man and straight, so something is obviously going on here. In 2018, the razor company Gillette, which I personally use as I know I'm never trying to grow a beard again, issued an advertisement in support of Me Too activists and their ideals. Their advertisement strategy relies around, revolves around the best a man can get. And they argued that the best a man could get was not the idea of, of masculinity that allows sexual assault to occur. And even though this message is pretty widely agreed upon, men saw it as an attack on themselves. It faced massive backlash simply because it was activism. The idea is so demonized in the idea of toxically masculine men that simply because it's activism, it's not supported. And it's not as if a world without toxic masculinity has every man being an activist. It's rather that masculinity won't be the sole factor stopping someone. Well, how do we stop toxic masculinity? How do we change the societal expectations currently placed on men? It starts with everyone watching this right here. By simply encouraging men to take a step away from this model and embrace traits that might be traditionally seen as not masculine. You know, crying when needed, showing emotions, not needing to be dominant or the alpha. And over time, just on a more individual level, on a more relational level, men seeing other men doing this ultimately results in a ripple effect. As the University of St. Louis found that men who see other men engaging in healthy habits feel justified in doing the same. That as men see other men engaging in these healthy things and embracing not traditionally masculine traits, the role, the traditional role of masculinity just simply dissipates. At the end of the day, I'm just a 17-year-old guy who can't grow a beard, but I was hooked on this website devoted solely to it. And it wasn't because of the beards, but it was rather because of what I saw in it. I saw a social change that I feel would have incredibly positive impacts on the world around us. Once again, the issue is not men, but it's rather just men committed to this act of masculinity. The boys of today will be the men of tomorrow, and I hope that they do not have to hide behind the same beard of masculinity that many men do today. Thank you.